Okay then, to introduce the bike, this is the Zero DSR ZF13.0, it's the 2016 model. And I've had it since um, June the 12th, I picked it up from um, Street Bike in Hale Sowen, near Birmingham, for people who don't know where Hale Sowen is. So I've had it for about a month and a half now. And uh, yeah, I'm due, it's actually due its first service, which is just a standard check. Uh, check on torque on bolts and the uh, the drive belt. Uh, I'm actually over overdue on that. Uh, it's due at 600 miles and I'm on 874 at the moment. So yeah, it's just a case of trying to book it in um, at a time that works. The disadvantage because of obviously electric bike dealerships aren't uh, to a penny so Hale so it's not a million miles away but it's still the other side of Birmingham. I do live in the, I live in Nuneaton in Warwickshire. So I'm actually one of their <laughs> relatively speaking close customers I suppose. But nevertheless it's quite a trek and just logistically to organise a service and things like that it's uh, it can be quite good quite fun you know um, as it goes I'm going to ride over on Saturday and uh, I'll just wait while they do the service or possibly I've been offered a lone bike I might go, may go out and have a little spin out somewhere but uh, yeah I picked it up on the 12th of June uh, it's quite a long delay I test rode one I've seen the video of me test riding the demo bike which is the same model in fact, I test rode the demo bike, wasn't convinced about a dual sport model at all, uh, but took it out on a ride to Ludlow. There's another video for that. And uh, yeah, I brought it back from that. I kind of fell in love with it on the ride out and just went, yeah, you know, I, I really get this bike. I really enjoyed it. So I knew that the demo bike was up for sale. It was listed up for sale. At, 2000 below the list price and so I kind of snapped the hand off I went well yeah I'll, I'll buy that please now while we were going through all the uh, starting to look into that a phone call came through so in all honesty I was a little bit suspicious about it first um, it was supposedly a film company wanted to make a film with a zero and take it to the Isle of Man and the demo bike uh, they negotiated with zero to take the demo bike from street bike and use that for the purpose of this one and initially I thought oh, it's a bit of a fob off maybe they don't want to sell it after all but um, yeah just called me a bit a little bit skeptical but uh, as it transpired they were actually it was completely truthful um, and uh, yes the film is currently being put together uh, following the experiences of this bike being read to the to a uh, red red being ridden to the Isle of Man so uh, that will come out in due course I'm sure I look forward to seeing that um, I was a little bit gutted at the time because I'd really enjoyed the uh, the ride out and uh, enjoyed the I enjoyed the bike. I thought, yeah, I want this sooner than later. Like again, when else is quite impatient. But having come away from that, feeling a little bit sad and dejected, I had a I talked things over with my beloved, and she said, uh, "Why don't you buy the new one? Why don't you just buy a new one then?" Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're far from <laughs> rich and well off. Don't get me wrong. Um, uh, I won't go into massive financial details but we are a single income family so uh, yeah we're not uh, we're not as rich as Croesus as the, the say maybe um, but I've already sold on the concept of electric vehicles having owned a Nissan Leaf for a couple of years and I do also appreciate the, the cost benefits. Obviously, there's environmental benefits to electric vehicles. <coughs> Stupid debates aside about, uh, yeah, well, we won't go into that. There's a lot of nonsense spoken by people who don't really understand electric vehicles or don't consider how electricity is generated. But uh, 
that's a that's a rant of a different colour. Um, so yeah, we're not we're not massively well off by any means, but I had a, I had a bit of savings. We we saved a bit, and um, she obviously could see that I was quite keen on the bike, <laughs> so I was a bit sad. And we actually attended a. Um, a, cl a social evening for my uh, local IAM branch, the Coventry Warwickshire Advanced Motorcyclist. Uh, I'll give a quick shout out to them. Uh, are you on the phone? No? You alright? Yeah, okay. Alright. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, I think we went for gear then. <laughs> Silly. Um, yeah, so I went to this social evening and there was a inspirational woman gave a talk and uh, I'll put a link to her because she was she was really good. Claire Biddulph? Biddulph? Yeah, Claire, is it Claire Biddulph? Sorry Claire if I've got your name wrong. Can't remember. I think, I think that's right. Anyway. She gave a really inspirational talk. She was the first woman to, sort of to say, circumnavigate. She rode alone around the coastline of the UK, and it was all endorsed by Guinness Book of Records. And she had to ride to every extremity around the uh, around the island of Great Britain. And um, yeah, she she's uh, also a successful businesswoman. But uh, she ended her talk with a kind of a carpe diem, seize the day kind of thing, you know. Um, if you've got a dream, go for it. And Emma and I were talking about it. So it might be my wife. Uh, we're talking about it on the way home and talked about it some more when we got home. And she said, yeah, I think you should go for it. We're, you know, you only live once and all that. So uh, we did. Yeah, overtaking on this bike is, is a dream. It's very easy. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I phoned back the I phoned back the dealership and said, okay, yes, we're interested in the new bike. If and I, I basically got them to throw in a, a few bits, a rack, um, and um, power socket and a few a few little bits, you know to sweeten the deal and oh, negotiate down the price a bit and um, I asked I said oh, the, the main thing I was concerned about was because I was going to go down the I've gone down the personal contract finance route so you've got the choice at the end of the deal of uh, the three year deal of keeping the bike paying off the balance or um, partexing it in effectively for another for a new bike or um, just walking away from the deal <clears throat> you know, selling back the, the remainder of the bike and with a guaranteed value on it so I already know in three years assuming I don't do ridiculous things to the bike it will be worth uh, £4,774 uh, I haven't mentioned the price actually uh, it's 13500 the uh, is the retail price of this bike I paid less than that but I won't disclose my figure because uh, that's between street bike and me um, yeah, so I've gone for the personal contract finance route and that way I can decide, uh, part of the thinking behind that was, you know, the progress being made in electric bikes. Um, this is great, this is a great bike, but in three years time we don't know what will be around the corner technology wise. It's progressing far, far faster than, you know, fossil fuel vehicles are. Of course, it would do. Uh, battery technology is improving all the time. Range has been increased. Range on this bike has increased. The motor has improved in, over the last year's model. It just gets better and better. So that needs to be borne in mind. So at the end of the deal, I suspect I'll probably change in the bike for a new one. I may not. I may may grow so attached to this that I don't want to. But we shall see. Now, talking about the, the bike a little bit, so the, the obvious question people ask is, what's the range? Well, the range is, it's, 
how long is a piece of string? I mean, how long is how far is the range on a on a conventional bike? Well, it depends how you ride it, doesn't it? If you're doing 30 miles an hour, you can go a lot further, and it's the same with an electric bike. Uh, you're a bit more sensitive to it on an electric bike, obviously. Um, but all things considered, it's kind of I'm finding it's between 90, 90 and 100 miles is is about realistic. I'm not doing that, having said that, I'm not doing that kind of journey generally. I have done pretty much that uh, soon after I got it. I did embark on quite a trek. I actually got back home with zero miles on the on the gasometer. So uh, I cut it fine. <clears throat> you can slow down, I'm doing 30. Cheeky thing. Oh, it's the car behind. Um, yeah, so the range is how you ride it, and there are people who've done ridiculously long distances, hypermiling, as we call it in the EV world, which is where you ride deliberately slow or drive deliberately slow to eke the maximum out of it. I think somebody's done 240 miles. It might be one of the the big names in electric bikes. Um, electric Terry, maybe. I'm not sure. <clears throat> So that is one of the things you just saw there, that pedestrian crossing. You do have to be a little bit more wary of... Well, you should be anyway. You're riding a, you're riding a dangerous vehicle. You should be a bit more aware of what's going on around you. Um, but you should be aware, sensitive to pedestrians. So, yeah, they really can't hear you as well. What, whatever anyone says, I know... Uh, I know you get some... Elect, um, electric EV enthusiasts saying that it doesn't make any difference but it, it does I mean you've only got to ride one for a while and you experience it cyclists are especially um, interesting actually if you're ever taking cyclists on a country road you can freak them out quite easily especially if they're listening to music um, yeah so the the range is i mean that one of the reasons i got this bike was to, to actually to prolong the life of my petrol bike which i love dearly i've had four i've had i bought it from you in 2007 done 60,000 miles from it i work from home so i don't commute um i've done some quite big trips on that petrol bike all around uh well, i've been down to the alps a few times switzerland austria germany dark countries um France, obviously, uh, Italy, going down to Spain later this year, for the first time on that bike, and yeah, I've used that a lot, I've, I want that to, I want that to live as long as possible, because I really do love that bike, so, um, on the CBF 1000, 2007 model, and uh, yeah, I'd like that to live as long as possible, and as I've mentioned, I'm I'm with the IAM, I'm now a, an observer, a local observer with the IAM, and so I do a lot of uh, observation runs with people, with uh, our associates, gearing up to pass the tests. Yeah, so I've done a few observer runs now with this bike, following an associate, and it's been really good. I found it to be excellent. It does freak the associates out of it, well, it freaks most people out. Um, I'm, I'm fairly sure a lot of the a lot of the guys in the club I a lot of the guys in the club pull, pull my leg about it of course it's bound to um, some are genuine, genuinely interested some genuinely don't get it they you know the people who ride bikes for the noise for the for the for the oil for the smell for the smell of the bike you know the petrol the every every all that all the greasy aspect of it they don't necessarily get it um, but I actually ride bikes for the experience. I don't ride for the bikes. I'm not I'm similar with cars. I don't really care too much about cars per se. They're just a, a, a way of me getting from A to B most of the time. Bikes are slightly different. I love the experience of riding a bike. I love the smells, the freedom, the... I'm just, just breathing in the air there. You're smelling the wood, smelling the countryside. It's 
yeah, okay, it's not always the nicest smell. Depends on the countryside smell you get, but you're you're experiencing what's going on around you, and obviously you're, you're that bit sat up from you where you would be in a car, uh, so you're taking the view. That that experience any biker will recognise <coughs> is fantastic, and that's that is why I ride a bike. It's not for all the other. It's certainly not for the mechanical stuff. I am pretty basic when it comes to mechanical stuff. Yeah, I've done all changes before, standard stuff, adjusted the chain, all the usual, you know, standard maintenance things. But uh, if it came to doing anything sort of major, it would be a bit of a, it would be a hassle for me just because I haven't done it. It's not that I couldn't necessarily do it if I applied myself to it. It's that I'm not really interested in doing it. I'd rather pay somebody who did it well and safely um, than attempt it myself. But yeah, that's that kind of sums up my relationship with mechanics of bikes as well. I only ride them, I don't know what makes them go. Uh, electrical one, it's a little bit easier of course. Uh, what makes it go? Well, it's an electric motor. There's... <laughs> There's bugger all to it, really. There's a moving part. I'm not. I'm not detracting in any way, shape, or form from the technology that's gone into making something that works like this and works so well. And it and it does. It's credit to those people in California, just down the road from Tesla Zero, who make this bike. That they've done. Uh, they've done such a great job over the last few years. You know, they've been building electric bikes in a very serious way for quite a few years now. And um, the first ones are the contrast with the with the new generation as opposed to the first ones is, is marked very much. The bike itself, dual sport. Why did I go for dual sport? Well actually as I said I I enjoyed the I enjoyed the test ride a lot. It's quite a different experience for me riding what is effectively a naked bike because I'm used to a sports tourer so That does um, that does offer me a new experience, and I quite like that. I quite like that difference from the sports tour for a change. Um, physically, I'm higher up slightly. It is a taller bike than my CBF thousand. One of the things I liked about the CBF thousand was it that I can. I can uh, I can sit on it with both soles of my feet on on the floor either side easily, uh, which is nice nice comforting thing. This is a little bit is a little bit tiptoey. It is a nice bike. Uh, I'm sat I'm conscious that I am sat closer to the handlebars than I am on the on the CBF thousand. Uh, that's. That was quite an interesting thing to get used to initially on bends. That just that physical change. For those of you who ride lots of different bikes, it's probably no big deal at all. But for me, having ridden a CB1000 pretty much exclusively for years, um, it was quite an interesting sensation. I do carry around with me, it is worth carrying around with you a uh, a kettle lead, a PC lead, 13 amp lead. Uh, it's just a standard, like I say, PC kettle lead. Hello, Kenilworth Castle. My historic place. I'm just going to shut up just for a second. Take in Kenilworth Castle. Yeah, you do get, it is worth carrying around a kettle lead because then if you get stuck anywhere, you're not stuck. Um, I will talk about charging actually in a minute. So yeah, kettle lead's always worth having with you. There is a storage space thing here where the fuel tank would be on a conventional bike. That's a little bag, I'll show that later. Uh, and that's that's quite handy. Let me think of immediate issues I've found with the bike. Because it doesn't have a gearbox, 
uh, when it comes to parking, if you're on a slight gradient, you've got no means of effectively putting on a, like the equivalent of a handbrake. There's, there's no way of braking it. So I can't say it's been a big problem. The side stand's quite sturdy on the bike and I haven't yet found a gradient where I've needed to use what I ended up buying as a solution, which is a, uh, a handbrake lock. Well, it's not really, a, it's not a lock, but it just clamps over the handbrake, over the front brake lever, and uh, you just pull it and clamp it, so it, it locks the front brake on, basically. Well, that was the first weird thing. Um, I've put... Hello? I've put on the back of the bike a... Uh, uh, a top box. So you have got this storage thing here, but I needed something a bit more substantial for... Mainly for carrying IM course stuff around it. Our observer's handbook and things. And just and radios and things. Although I tend to keep radio stuff in the front here. And I've got um, a PTT, a Presto Talk switch here on the left handlebar. I've wired that up so that it it goes down. I've got an autocom kit fitted in here. Well, not fitted. It's, it's in there with just a, a nine volt battery actually, so it's not permanently fitted at all. Uh, the other, oh, the other, the other obvious thing I noticed, because I'm not used to riding naked bikes, is wind resistance. And I know from quite a few guys who ride these Zeros that that can have, well, it's just basic aerodynamics. That does have an effect on range. So, at some point I will look at fitting a screen to the front here. They do do, there is a screen available. In fact, there's, I think there's a few options for a screen. It kind of wants something in keeping with the style of the bike. I'm not going to be hypermiling on it. So something that actually looks quite nice, but it's fairly small and unobtrusive, would be quite nice. And the zero, the, the, the zero one they do is it's quite pleasant. I'll, I'll just have to wait, save a few pennies because it's not the cheapest thing. Nothing ever is in bikes. Um, for people who are interested in such things, there's there's no 12 volt battery on this. There's no there's no kind of normal bike battery you'd have. It's just the standard. It's actually just the drive battery. So in order to fit ancillary equipment, you have to use a special spur, uh, a special lead from the main battery, the main drive battery. Um, oh, which I'm led to believe has a maximum of three spurs on it. Now I don't know whether you can fit additional ones, I don't... <clears throat> From the way I was told it didn't sound like you could. Um, there may be other people who are more familiar with zeros who could... Uh, who may contradict that and say, well no, you can fit lots of things on if you want to. Obviously, if you're taking energy out of the main drive battery, you're reducing your range. But it's all... It's it's all relative to what you're using it for, of course. You can uh, you could be using hardware which doesn't actually drain that much. I've got a sat nav bike. I've mounted the sat nav on the bike. Um, that again, that was that was part of the deal I made with <coughs> with the dealership that they fit the bracket. I bought the bracket and they fitted it. So I've got the sat nav. I uh, another part of the deal was I got them to fit a 12 volt accessory socket, and the bike's set up to take that. So it's just there on the right next to the dash. Um, the other thing I'm fitting this weekend is uh, when it goes in for its first servicing. I'm having the uh, the tracker fitted.
having a track fitted, a uh, Road Angels tracker. So uh, I've heard good, good reports about those. Very good reports about those in terms of recovery rates. If your bike gets nicked. And the Road Angel seems to have a few advantages that some of the others on the market don't have. They're all much of a muchness, but I think the VHF tracking is uh, is particular to the the Road Angel one. Here we are in Meriden, in the historic <coughs> historic centre of England. Don't tell them it's not really the centre of England. That's a few miles up the road. Historically thought to be the centre of the England and that stone cross thing there, Malarkey, supposedly marks it. Yeah, bit of tourism for you. Meriden near Coventry. And this is where um, Triumph used to be based many years ago, now in Hinkley. Which again, is a few miles away from here. In fact, again in Leicester, which, which is where the historic centre of England is. <clears throat> um, sorry, the centre of England, I should say. There are three modes on the Zero. There's, uh, there's a sports mode, an eco mode, and a custom mode, custom riding mode. And those each affect certain parameters. Uh, the sports and eco modes are cars pulling out in front of you. No, the sports and eco modes are system. They're predefined by uh, by zero, so they've got predefined, predefined parameters. And eco is basically a bit. It's uh, it's a bit it lays off on the torque a bit to save energy. So I don't particularly enjoy riding with that mode on because it's. It's quite unfamiliar. I think you could get used to it fairly easily, I suppose. But it doesn't give you the feel of acceleration you're used to from a from a bike. So I suspect most bikers won't ever use. I might be wrong. Long distance, or if you're trying to eke out mileage, you may use that. But I can't really see me using it. Uh, sports mode is what I rode the bike in when I I took it out for a demo. Uh, the demo bike, I should say, not this one. It's the same model but different bike um, and the sports of sport gives you what you'd expect it gives you a lot of torque and it's you know it's it's a normal bike feel to it uh, although slightly less engine braking regen in this case than you probably used to on a normal bike I didn't I th I saw I wanted to put a bit more regen on when I took it out for a, for a demo. So that brings me on to the third mode, the custom mode, which is user customizable, and there is a zero app for smartphones for the, at least for the Apple iOS and Android systems. There's an app which allows you to tweak those settings. Uh, the app also displays additional information. You can mount it on your handlebars and use it as an extra extra display thing. Uh, or it just syncs with Bluetooth to the bike. Um, you just hold down the mode button for a few seconds and um, you set up the Bluetooth connection between the bike and the app and Bob is your sister's brother. Pretty straightforward. So yeah, I've uh, I've rolled on full regen for the engine braking because because I like the engine braking, but also because I like using regen. And you can ride a lot. You can ride without really using gear, uh, gears. Without really using weight. You definitely ride without using gears on the zero. Uh, you can ride without using your brakes really. If your observation is good enough, you see hazards early enough, you don't race up to light when they're red. Obviously there's still a need to give information to other road users, so you know, if there's somebody behind you, don't, don't just roll off the throttle and, and suddenly you know, effectively brake because that's a bit inconsiderate. OK, 
Castle Lane. Now we're coming into a national speed limit here. Between the UK 60 miles per hour. Hopefully. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to do 0 to 60. Change the dog motion. Right. Okay. 3, 2, 1, go. Whoa! Okay, that's the first time I've done that quite so vigorously. I had to... Uh... That's quite frightening. <laughs> uh, charging. No, I haven't talked about charging. Uh, charging takes about... It takes about nine hours, I think, with uh, domestic socket. Now, before people freak out about that, you just got to think about what you do in terms of riding. Uh, if you, and if you, it's like the car. If you do regularly massive long trips, it's not a bike that you really want to do that unless you're one of the the guy, like the guys in the states. We, you know, the guys who are really pushing the envelope with them. We've got multiple charges they take with them. Um, uh, I'll come on to the question of rapid charging actually. Uh, so the the option at the moment is you do what I'm doing, which is you, you use the normal domestic socket, charge overnight. What is the ordinary thing? Uh, if you want a faster option than that, there are a couple of ways you can get. Well, there's a few ways you can get. You can buy. You can either buy the charge tank accessory, which replaces the storage compartment here where the fuel tank would be on a normal bike. And um, <clears throat> for that, you get a you get a level two charge rate. Um, so you can use some of the publicly available infrastructure. It's commonly used for cars. And that reduces your charge time from around nine hours to around three, I believe. Which, frankly, you know, if it's two thousand pounds for that, it doesn't really seem worth it to me, anyway. It may do to somebody else. It obviously, depends on your circumstances. But now, to me, that seems a little bit unnecessary. So your other option for faster, faster than normal charging is you can get outboard chargers and you can plug, well as far as zero indoors, you can plug up to three of those in, in parallel and, and use them. Obviously they cost whatever, they're not cheap. Uh, so you can, you can add one and increase it, uh, decrease your charge time quite considerably. Um, not quite considerably, a fair bit, and then add a second and a third. You can, I think, I think you can have up to three external charges. And there are some people that use that method on the road. In fact, they'll actually take, they actually mount the charges to the bike. Uh, again, that's not something I fancy doing. Um, uh, the reality is, if I'm going to be doing, if I if I want something to do longer trips on the bike, I want the kind of charging that's available for cars. You know, I go anywhere in the Leaf and I can charge up to eighty percent in, you know, well, various between half an hour and forty minutes, say, depending on how empty the the battery is, and that's more viable. Now there is there is more recently. Um, a company Digi now who have put together a supposedly come up with a means of doing proper rapid charging which will charge up to 100% in under an hour and that is that is quite interesting news um, it'll be more interesting if 
from my perspective, um, if it's sufficiently approved by Zero, and I think there are talks along those lines as as we speak, as I speak. So if that comes off, th that will be great. That will be really good. That will be interesting. That will be an interesting thing to look at. Although my dilemma is, well, firstly, it would depend how much it would cost as to whether it's worth it or not. You know, if it's hideously expensive and it's only suitable for this bike, then I'm probably not going to. I'm not going to buy it because the reality is, I probably won't keep this bike after three years. I may be wrong, but I, I, I doubt it. But that would be a big disincentive to buy something like that anyway, because especially if in three years it's redundant technology. Now they may, they may go to go to some extent to future proof it. Um, I would kind of hope they would, but you never know, really. I mean, they should in, they should in theory should kind of should kind of future proof it. Um, so yeah, the the rapid charging would be of definite interest. And I, know, I know there's a lot of other. I know that would open up the market massively to people ad uh, mass adoption of uh, electric bikes. I'm sure it would. I am content with the bike as it is, and I. I knew that going into buying it, I thought, well, there you go, I'm using regen there, nothing behind me, just rolled off the throttle, not touching the brake, I got down to 30 without using brakes at all, and I put energy back into the battery, same here, the light's just changing, nothing behind me, just rolling off, letting it slow down. As I was saying, when it comes to normal charging, so I went, I went into it with my eyes wide open, thinking, right, okay, well, I'm limited to 100 miles on trips. That's fine because if I want to do any bigger, bigger journeys than that, I'll use the petrol bike. Simple as that. And uh, I know that it's going to take around nine hours to charge if I need to charge uh, from empty to full. <clears throat> Not going to be an issue. So. I haven't, uh, I'm not seriously going to look into any rapid charging options until something is available which would offer that, you know, full charge in an hour, under an hour, well, ideally half an hour, you know, oh, okay, let's be reasonable, 45 minutes, that would be, uh, that would be fantastic, uh, until that's available I'm not, I'm not really that interested in any other charge options as I say other people maybe if you if you do a commute that's fairly longish huh, it would have to be quite a sizable commute and you'd have to well I don't, I don't know I can't I can't picture anybody commuting actually and not being able to manage with the bike as it is you'd have to have an insanely long commute to do more than you know, I don't know, 80 miles each way and decide you're going to do it on a bike. I say 80 miles each way because you could, of course, plug the bike in while you're at work and charge it while you're at work all day. Um, so if, you, if you're in that scenario, still the normal charging would be fine. So let's just talk about, let's think about it from the perspective of somebody who wants to do a long trip, a tour. And that... Uh, that's when it gets interesting. So I like trips down to the Alps, for instance. And a rapid charger option does does kind of open up the possibility of doing those kind of trips. I have to say, looking at it completely realistically, if you were doing that kind of trip, uh, the likelihood is given what you're taking, what you're carrying, and the sort of speeds you'd be doing if you were if, if you were riding normally, you're probably going to struggle to get 60 miles out of a full charge. B 
because <clears throat> there's no doubt about it if you're doing 70 miles per hour you know it does it does reduce the, the range quite significantly don't believe the hype if you think you can do 100 miles on this bike at 70 miles an hour you're very much mistaken it will not do that um, when it when it gets low on battery you you kind of roll off <laughs> like I said I did I've done a big I've done a biggish trip on it I've used the full extent of the battery I've ridden it down to zero <laughs> ridden it down to zero on a trip um, and of course as you're nearing nearing journey's end and you're getting very close you just roll off the throttle you don't uh, you don't ride as fast and your range is extended so it's quite an organic thing when you're used to it but you're certainly not going to do uh, talking about the longer trips <laughs> if you're going down to the Alps and you have to stop and charge for an hour every 70 miles it's going to take you a long time let's let's be fair about it it's still not really the right kind of bike at the moment for that kind of trip <coughs> let's let you go then let's back it out onto a main road yes you're welcome you big loony um It's not, it's not a viable thing at the moment. Now, if we get, as batteries improve in, in a few years' time, I'm no doubt we'll see ranges go up quite considerably in batteries. As density improves, and capacity improves, I should say. You know, who knows what's, what's around the corner in terms of battery technology. And Zero is certainly leading the field by all accounts on battery technology. Uh, I have heard it said that their batteries are virtual intestinals in terms of uh, capacity. <clears throat> right, it's something they've worked on quite hard. So, yes. Uh, watch this space in terms of those developments. It could be quite interesting in the next few years. Yeah, if you've got a bike that'll do 300 miles on a charge, and only takes an hour to charge, then it's it's cracked. Totally, totally cracked. Then it really does open up a world of possibilities.